Assalamualaikum, Madam. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry, I was there throughout. I heard Dr. Mona Samer's entire lecture, and then I don't know what happened. My mic, I switched on my mic, but I think either you forgot to switch it on. Anyway, I think we have to somehow cater for the lost time. I think in this whole struggle, we forget one thing. And that is the role of media in the world. And um, there are certain misperceptions about this whole thing. For example, many people believe that uh, uh, the Palestinians sold their land. I studied this problem very thoroughly. And uh, I learned that the Palestinians maybe five, seven percent Palestinians sold their land. The rest of the land was occupied in under one pretext or another by the occupying power. They are called mandatory power, but I think mandatory system was just an eyewash. Britain was the occupying power. They used to, under one pretext or another, they used to confiscate Palestinian land and sell it to Jewish League, to the Zionists. This was a major problem. That is how the so-called mandatory power turned Palestinian majority into minority. They were encouraging. I was reading a thesis written by uh, a lady. She was Hindu. Before, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Punjab University, she covered the history of mandate years. And in that, she said that uh, the land was occupied and handed it over, the British handed this over to the Jews, to the Zionists. So this, but it's so difficult to fight against this misperception. For 36 years, when I was teaching in Karachi University, I was trying to dispel this misperception and after that, in my writings, I have tried to bring the facts out that it was the British who were interested in changing demographic reality um, in one way or another. As Dr. Monin said, that now India is trying to do the same thing in Indian occupied Kashmir. Another issue is that uh, the UN was dealing with the issue of um, uh, the issue of Palestine, and this General Assembly was unable to settle the matter. When the resolution was presented, the General Assembly could not agree, and then the United States did some arms twisting and they succeeded in changing the votes of three countries. I know, I remember Philippines, there were two others and that's how United States got its so-called majority. So the General Assembly resolution is a very, very questionable thing. It's not really a proper, the on the first occasion, General Assembly failed to agree. On the second occasion, after arm twisting by the US, they got three votes. It was a very slight, tiny, uh, you know, uh, majority through which they passed this. Another important thing is that UN has no right to go 
and divide any other country's uh, land. Let me give you an example. Suppose the UN passes a resolution. I know they can't do it because the United States has a veto. But suppose they pass a resolution saying that uh, New York will now become the homeland of the Rohingya. Do you think the world community is going to accept this? My short submission is that UN has no right to go and occupy a country and the League of Nations did it and now the UN is supposed to have passed a resolution. On all these grounds, I call Israel an illegitimate state. UN has no right to go and authorize the colonization of Palestine. So on this ground, we can call it Israel an illegitimate state. We can call Israel an illegal state. It has no right to sit on the land of Palestinians. Another point which I think is very important to understand, you know, any Jew can go and on landing on Israeli, uh, what is now called Israeli soil, they get the nationality. On the other hand, a Palestinian who was driven out of Palestine in 1948, 49, 67, yesterday, they don't have the right to return. Now, this is a very, very racist approach. And I think the racist mentality and the racist existence of Israel is becoming it's well accepted now. And another important point to understand is that Israel is an expansionist state. Why am I saying this? Am I saying this only because I am um, a supporter of Palestinians? No, I'm not saying this because I'm a supporter of Palestinians. I am saying this on legal grounds. Whenever a country applies for admission to United Nations, they have to submit a map. And I learned through very authentic uh, books and writings that Israel did not submit a map, and yet they were allowed to become a member of United Nations. The other thing is that, you know, on the parliament building of Israel, they have put up a map, and under that map, they say that uh, all the territory from, uh, you know, uh, what is now Israel to parts of Saudi Arabia is going to be part of greater Israel. The whole of Palestine, the whole of Jordan, parts of Iraq, parts of Syria, and parts of Saudi Arabia. Imagine where the Zionist state is now, and imagine where Saudi Arabia is. They want all these territories to be part of uh, the Zionist state. So they have plans to expand further. Dr. Munis pointed out that they expanded in 1948. They took more territory than was given to them by United Nations. Then they grabbed territory in 1967. And they have plans to create greater Israel. They have plans to grab more territory. And uh, the so-called state of Israel is going to be so big 
from Palestine right up to parts of Saudi Arabia. They have already driven Palestinians out and the ones who remained in uh, Palestine and the ones they took over in the 1967 war, they're in the process of driving them out now. The UN passed a resolution, the Palestinians opted for a two-state solution. I don't know, some of you might have been there. I invited a Palestinian doctor who's now a British citizen when her family was driven out of Palestine. She became a British citizen uh, as a child. Now she's a full-grown, very famous lady, Ghada Karmi. Dr. Ghada Karmi came to one of my seminars in Karachi University, and she said that two-state solution solutions have been discussed. Number one, the one proposed by UN in 1948, it talked about two-state solution, that two independent sovereign states should emerge in Palestine. I think this very fact was unfair. But anyway, if you accept this idea of two states, Israel has now made it impossible to create two states. They have occupied land, created Jewish settlements on that land. Jewish settlements have been provided by roads and communication network with the results that there can't be a contiguous, viable Palestinian state. So they'll have to forget about the uh, two-state solution. And Ghada Kar Dr. Ghada Karmi suggested that there should be one state uh, where Jews and Arabs should live together and uh, this should be, you know, Palestinians should be allowed to return and then the Jews who want to, who are living in Palestine should also be allowed to continue there uh, as long as they want to. The Palestinian, the idea of a Palestinian state for which the Palestinians opted when they signed, when PLO signed peace agreement with Israel, it's a Palestinian state, contiguous Palestinian state, a viable Palestinian state, naturally no uh, settlements, Jewish settlements will be tolerated on Palestinian soil. Al-Quds was to be capital of this state and uh, the return of Palestinians should be ensured. Now, if all these things are not possible because of the Jewish settlements, because now Israel has totally violated the framework on the basis of which Palestinian state was to be created. I think after the return of Palestinians, now I think they'll have to think out of box. Maybe one state, a binational state, including Palestinians as well as Jews who want to stay on, Palestinian return is a must. Without the return of Palestinians who were forced out of their country, there can be no peace uh, solution, peaceful solution. So the Palestinians will have to come back to their land and one state, a binational state, might be more workable under these circumstances. 
the Jews don't want it. I, I shouldn't say Jews, I should say the Zionists don't want it. Why? Because they fear that ultimately the Jews don't have that, those roots in Palestine. So long as they have come from their foreign lands, United <coughs> States, Britain, France, you know, so long as they can have a comfortable life, they would like to be there. But if Palestinians return, and if it's an, a state where both the groups are equal, they had equal powers, many Jews might run back to their old countries. And the Zionist fear that it's going to be become a Palestinian majority state like it was always in history. So that's why the Zionists have ruled out this solution. But I think the world community has to think about these uh, various possibilities. Today, I was reading an article shared on one of the groups to which I belong. And under that, a Jewish professor, an Israeli professor has said that this is almost the end of story for Israel. Why is he saying that? His point of view is that the way things are going, the way Israel is stopping all peace efforts, many Israelis are going to get disgruntled. They would like to leave uh, what is called Israel. So he said Israel should mend its ways. Israel should uh, accept reality. Israel should know that they can't drive out all the Palestinians and the Palestinians will always be there. The Palestinians have not given up the struggle in the last 70 years. It's the Arab governments who were defeated in various wars, not the Palestinians. The Palestinians are still dedicated to the idea of an independent Palestine. And according to this Jewish professor, uh, for me, Jewish names are very difficult to uh, remember, but uh, um, Sidra Cyber, if you want, I can send the name and the article to you. I thought this article written by a Jewish professor and is really professor is very meaningful. For me, it was an eye opener. For me, it was something that restored my hope, but it also brought, uh, brought out the point that unless Israel sees realities, ground realities, unless they recognize these ground realities, nothing will happen. And when I started my talk, I said, uh, uh, one more point needs to be mentioned. International law does not recognize territories taken by force. Israel took the 1967 territories by force. Therefore, even many Western countries don't recognize uh, Al-Quds as a part of Israel. They don't recognize occupied West Bank as a part of Israel. So, this is a very well-established principle of international law. And I talked about uh, the role of media. The media is extremely important in our era. Unfortunately, the Western media is uh, very supportive of Zionism because most, a lot of Zionists, Jews, work for media and control media in the West. 
you must have never heard of Jewish protocols. The elders of Zion uh, got together, I think it was last century, no, century before last, this was end of 19th century. These elders of Zion got together and it was not an open advertised meeting. They were meeting privately and they passed 24 protocols. I have seen those protocols. The man who was translating them into Russian first did that after a very long struggle, health problems, everything cropped up then. But the protocols have been translated into English also. And if you read those protocols, I have a copy of that. If you read the protocols, you will know that what is happening in the world today is what I read in those protocols. When I got the protocols, you know, our training is, as social scientists, our training is that we don't And uh, there was so much propaganda against Jewish protocols, uh, or they're called the protocols of the elders of Zion. I did not believe them also. I read them with a lot of skepticism. And this skepticism was there with me for... Uh, this is all I want to say. If there are questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam, uh, for providing us with a totally different, we can say, the alternative opinion on a single issue. Um, it was, again, a very thought-provoking um, talk from your side. And since you are the expert in medicine st studies, uh, I was expecting the same uh, level of well-researched um, talk from your side. I really want to thank you for joining us and for having patience uh, um, for such a long time that you were connected but uh, unable to um, talk. Actually, there was some problem with the mic. And now uh, I would like to ask my student to uh, ask some questions if they have. Ahmed Khalid. Sure. Ahmed Khalid. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Munis Amar and Professor Talat Bizarat. Thank you very much, sir. And ma'am, it was a very informative session from both of you. Ma'am, uh, my first, my one question uh, from ma'am Talat Bizarat is that uh, you have mentioned the protocols of the elders of the Zion. Ma'am, uh, in as I've researched about this book uh, before, I I came I I came to this book, uh, which is which was written by Morris Jolly, the dialogues in hell between Machiavelli and Montesco, which he which he wrote uh, on Napoleon as a satire. And the content of the Protocols of the Elder of Zion, I found some of the content on that book, which was copied from that book, the dialogues uh, between Machiavelli and Montesk, which was supposed to be a satire on Napoleon. So, uh, did the left point out to the, uh, to the Jews that the liberalism is a Jewish conspiracy and the right, uh, the left point out the liberalism is a Jewish conspiracy, and the right wing point out that the communism is a Jewish conspiracy. And we Muslims, we Muslims find out Jewish conspiracies in all about everything, including this coronavirus. So, ma'am, can you please uh, update us on that? That what is the real 
Can I answer the question now? Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for your patience and uh, congratulations to everyone uh, because the moon is sighted and I will be having Eid celebration tomorrow. Oh, moon is sighted. I think it was a very pertinent question and uh, I, I was telling him that uh, telling the students actually I got that book free when you get a book free chances are that you won't read it when you pay with your hard earned money then you read the book immediately. So I didn't read it for four years. I got it about 28 years back. Didn't read it for four years. After four years, I read some mention of it in another scholarly work. Then I read it. And in the beginning, I was very skeptical. Even, you know, Five, six years after reading that, I remained skeptical. Actually, there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of efforts to discredit that book. I don't know why people don't want people to read that uh, work. Theek hai, padne de, aur usko discredit na kare, na credit kare. Logo ko padna chahiye aur apna conclusion draw karna chahiye. Uske andar, ab jaisi ye conspiracy ki baat aati hai. International politics mein to conspiracies hoti hai bohat. Second World War mein United States ko nahi join karna chahiye tha. Unka plan bhi nahi tha, lekin... U.S. establishment ने डिसाइड किया कि हमारा फायदा है हमें जॉइन करना चाहिए हम मिलिटरीली बहुत स्ट्रॉंग हैं हम इससे फायदा उठा सकते हैं इसी तरह बुश ने कहा था कि मुस्लिम फंडामेंटलिस्ट ग्रुप्स की एक कंस्पिरेसी है कि दे वांट टू टेक ओवर द वर्ल्ड आई थॉट इट वाज अ वेरी funny thing on the part of Bush to say this, because here fundamentalist parties bahut kamzor thi. Muslim countries bahut kamzor hain. Aur agar iske bawajood ye conspiracies ho rahi hain, to iska ek matlab nikalta hai ki international relations mein conspiracies common hain. So I think we should read every book with an open mind. And as things are happening, I don't think that everything is being done in the world by the Zionists. They are powerful, but I don't think they are that powerful. They can't uh, uh, implement all their con uh, conspiracies. They have conspiracies, but they can't implement them. Similarly, when something happens, people say Illuminati is doing it. I don't think there's any group in the world now who are that strong, who can get away with everything. But yes, the Zionists had their own conspiracies. It was a conspiracy to plan to get Palestine to, you know, take away Palestine. They went. A delegation went under Theodore Herzl they talked, they passed the resolution, then they went, they talked to, I think uh, Khalifa Abdul Hamid was ruling over uh, the Ottoman Empire then, and they went and they wanted to uh, get the right to settle in Palestine. He said, you can come as individuals, but no Jewish state because Palestine is not my uh, property. I can't hand it over to you. So the thing is that groups do conspiracies, but we should not assume that everything that is happening in the world is the result of some conspiracy. Read uh, the 
protocols of the elders of Zion, then reach your own conclusion. Read everything that you get hold of. Um, the, you know, attempt Khalid mentioned that uh, it's taken out from a satirical work. I think that this is, wherever he's read it, I would say it's an attempt to discredit um, this book, to dissuade people from reading it. And when I saw that there is an, a deliberate attempt to dissuade people to read this, then I said there must be something in it. I should read it. After all, it's lying uh, on my bookshelf for years and years. So then I read it. Sometimes discrediting a book becomes the cause of people turning their attention to it. So uh, if there are other questions, but I must say that Khalid asked a very pertinent question. Jo dil mein shukup hon ko nikalna chahiye bahar. Or madam, aapne isko bahut achhi tarah explain bhi kiya hai. I think ke Ahmed ke bhi jitni confusion hai. Or he is among one of the students jinke paas bahut zada questions hote hain. He is always skeptical towards everything. Or aapne isko bahut scientifically uh, explain kar diya hai ki unko kis tarike se apni approach leke chalni hai ahmed uh, i believe that now you have very much clarity about the things uh, which you want to filter out and uh, which you have to filter out in fact acha we have uh, some question from zainab and uh, jayan khan if jayan is present now zainab do you have some question Uh, yes, ma'am. Sidra, I must say you have a group of very bright students. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's a compliment for me and for DHS of our university. Zainab. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, may I ask my question? Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, so uh, I would like to make use of this uh, very. Uh, important opportunity that ma'am I wanted to ask that there is a lot of debate going on that whether they... yes ma'am I, I wanted to ask that uh, there is a whole lot of debate going on right now that whether this uh, whole uh, humanitarian crisis whether it is uh, would we call it a religious conflict or not uh, because we can see that Israel is most importantly you know uh, uh, making al Masjid al Aqsa a constant threat you know, to uh, for Palestinians and Muslim Ummah. So it is, a, it makes a lot of concern for Muslim Ummah. So uh, would you like to share some words with us? Uh, I missed your question in between. So I'm trying to make sense of what I heard. Uh, I think there are one or two things which are very important about uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Jews believed that there was a temple uh, centuries back. It was destroyed by the Romans. Uh, and they think that the Temple of Solomon, I think, is under the roots of, uh, under the foundation of Al-Aqsa Mosque. When Muslims came, there was nothing there. It had already been destroyed centuries back. So uh, they wanted to, uh, they built their mosque. Now today I did a lot of uh, exploratory work. I was reading the works of archeologists. I wanted to get to the root of this idea whether there is really some, you know, uh, uh, parts of uh, that uh, temple under the foundations of Alexa Mosque. And for that, I thought it's no use reading the works of Muslim archaeologists because um, I tried to go through the works of British archaeologists and a Jewish archaeologist also. 
and the Jewish archaeologists have said that there is no proof. And the British archaeologist, who was a lady, and uh, if I'm not wrong, she was also of Jewish faith, but uh, I'm not sure on this point. And uh, they both said that there is no truth behind this assertion that Al-Aqsa Mosque was built on the ruins of that Jewish uh, temple. There's no proof of that. But there are lots of myths. There are lots of myths circulating among Jews. And they believe, they suggest, these myths suggest that there was a temple which was destroyed by the Romans in, I think, uh, fourth century, uh, fifth century BC, even five, six hundred years before the birth of Christ, uh, according to these um, myths, it was destroyed by the Romans. We have no proof of all these things, and definitely they are not under the foundations of Alexa, but because these myths are so strong, you remember an Australian Jew tried to burn a Laksa mosque. It was rather simplistic of him to assume that by burning that mosque, he'll automatically, they'll automatically be able to build, rebuild the, according to them, rebuild the Jewish temple. Uh, on the basis of that, actually, after that, the Muslim states got together and they founded OIC. So the main thing was that uh, there was a Jewish attempt to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And I think that, again, there are attempts in this crisis. They tried to, uh, you know, probably... Uh, burn it down, uh, and these attempts are going to continue. As long as Muslim countries are weak and they don't show the resolve to protect Alaska, uh, Al-Aqsa, I think these Zionist groups will continue to make efforts to destroy the Alaqsa and uh, build a Jewish temple on it. Thank you so much, Madam, for such a detailed question. There is a question from uh, one student, Noman Rahim, and he asked about uh, the Muslim archaeologist ideology. Like, what are the myths that the Muslim uh, Muslims present or Muslim believe in? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I would like to ask Noman Rahim, uh, please, agar uh, se question pucho, because there is a lack of clarity what you actually want to know. So, zada acha hoga ki madam ko bhi samajh aayega yeh sawal. Noman. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Uh, well, ma'am, uh, what I wanted to ask was this: ke, uh, like uh, we are Muslims, so uh, exactly, uh, what are the myths that we are thinking? Ke, what is beneath Alaksa Masjid? Like, uh, what do we have to, like, it would uh, make us think a little bit to analyze okay, what is really going on. Okay. I think Muslims don't have any myths or theories or ideas about this. Uh, we know that probably uh, there was a temple somewhere but it's not, there is no archaeological proof that it was under Alaksa Mosque. Uh, Alaksa Mosque was built, you know, if you look at the terrain, I've naturally never been there. I've seen pictures. It seems to be built on a rock, rocky kind of thing. And 
I think that probably there's nothing under it. Probably there are no foundations of, uh, there, there, there are no ruins of the Jewish temple. This is the point of view of archeologists. Now, I am not an archeologist. I'm only reading their works. And uh, I have no reason to reject their point of view. They are the experts. I am not the expert. And uh, the Jewish idea of, a, you know, it serves their purpose. They are not experts. The experts I've quoted, one of them was definitely a Jewish uh, male professor of archaeology. And the other one was a Britisher. I don't know her religion. But anyway, both these experts are saying that there is nothing, no ruins of a temple under Alexa. So I'll just accept their point of view. Had I been an expert, had I been allowed to go to that area and investigate it myself, that would have been my preference. I would have loved to go and do that. But for now, I think we have no option but to accept the word of these two experts. I can pass on the names of these experts to your professor, uh, Madam uh, Sidra, if you are interested sure. in knowing the names of these uh, experts. We would definitely uh, like to know about the names and uh, what he has contributed in this regard. Emma, do you have some uh, something else to ask or should we end the session? Achha, okay. uh, thank you very much, ma'am. I have one more thing to ask, actually. Sure, sure. Ma'am, actually, I have two things to ask. Uh, sure. First, first, uh, I ask that uh, that what has been the policy of Pakistan towards this conflict and to uh, and during the Arab-Israel wars of 1948 and 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 then. No, the Six Day Wars of 1967, and between the Suez Canal conflict of 1956, because I have because I read that Pakistan was part of Sento, which uh, uh, and then the Baghdad Pact against the non-alliance movement against Egypt and India at that time was with Egypt, what was standing with Egypt, and India was standing with uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser, and Pakistan was against it. And it was, and uh, Pakistan was a part of Sento. First, ma'am, uh, my question is that, what what has been the policies toward and of Pakistan, mm -hmm. and was it right? Now, my and my second question is that, ma'am, why are the far right religious parties of Pakistan right now are silent over mm -hmm. this issue? Because we have seen them whenever there is a conflict, whenever there is a domestic conflict, conflict, they they are the first to emerge and they are the first to 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 create riots and chaos everywhere but why are they silent over this important issue now i have these two questions i'm i i hope okay I in response to your first question in response to your first question oh okay please carry on in response to your uh, to his first question, I would say that there are two different parts here. Pakistan's consistent policy is to support the Palestinians. That's why we don't recognize Israel. We consider Israel to be an illegitimate state. A lot of pressure was put on Pakistan on different occasions. But, but Pakistan refused to recognize Israel. You are right in saying this is our consistent policy, not, recognizes, uh, not recognizing Israel, supporting the rights of Palestinians. It includes all their rights, right of return, right of statehood, and all that. You are right that we did not have good relations with Egypt and some other Arab countries, that's true. 
I agree that we did not have good relations because we were following different camps. It's a very sad thing, but we put all our eggs in the Western basket and made the terrible mistake of joining US-sponsored military alliances. And Egypt was totally against those military alliances. I can understand why Egypt was against them. So it's true, both these points are true. Pakistan's policy is that we don't recognize Israel and we consider Israel to be an illegitimate state and we consider Palestinian struggle to be legitimate. Number two, yes, it's an unfortunate uh, fact of history that we did not have good relations with Egypt, Syria, Iraq, all these countries, socialist countries, camp followers of Soviet Union, because we were camp followers of United States. And the other thing, your question, I think, I didn't think about it then, but now that you've raised it, I'm also thinking that uh, Muslim parties have not done anything, no, except Jamaat Islami. I was reading in Dawn today that Palestine Foundation, led by Dr. Abu Maryam, a very eminent Pakistani scholar, and the Jamaat Islami, both of them were there. They were demonstrating in different places. Uh, the uh, Palestine Foundation was demonstrating in front of press club and Jamaat Islami was demonstrating somewhere in uh, Bulshan Iqbal, but they were both demonstrating against illegitimate, uh, cruel policies of Israel these days. Are you done, madam? Yes. Thank you so much, madam. Last of all, the last question and answers you have given. I think there are a lot of questions that the students have in mind, especially related to the Pakistan foreign policy towards this case of Palestine. This has helped a lot of the students in making their own analysis and understanding what Pakistan may According to their foreign policy. Do you think that there will be a change in this case? Or we will be consistent with the same policy? If you think that the future... I hope. Okay. No, in the past few days, something was happening. The Saudi Arabia was putting pressure on Pakistan. The Saudi Arabia was putting pressure on Pakistan. The Saudi Arabia was putting pressure on Pakistan. The Saudi Arabia was putting pressure on Israel. अब वो तो सऊदी अरेबिया को ये डर्टी रोल प्ले नहीं करना चाहिए था अगर उन्होंने किया है मेरा ख्याल है कि हमारी पॉलिसी जो अभी है वो मॉरली बहुत साउंड ग्राउंड्स पे है और जो यू नो वी हैव टू डिस्टिंग्विश बिटवीन मुस्लिम उमा एंड मुस्लिम गवर्नमेंट्स गवर्नमेंट्स ने ये तरीका शुरू किया हुआ है मुस्लिम गवर्नमेंट्स कोशिश कर रही हैं पिछले दिनों में यूएई ने और बहरीन ने और सूडान ने इजराइल को रिकॉग्नाइज किया कहा जाता था इसके पीछे सऊदी इन्फ्लुएंस है लेकिन पाकिस्तान ने नहीं किया मेरा ख्याल है पाकिस्तान को नहीं करना चाहिए हमारी ये पॉलिसी जो अभी है ये मॉरेलिटी पे बेस्ड है और दिस इज इन कीपिंग विद द स्पिरिट ऑफ अम्मा गवर्नमेंट्स नहीं लोग जो हैं पीपल तो मैं मैं आपको अपना पर्सनल व्यू दे रही हूँ कि मैं इजराइल को बिल्कुल और मेरा ख्याल है कि पाकिस्तान को कभी रिकॉग्नाइज नहीं करना चाहिए इस्राइल को कायद आजम, the founder of Pakistan said this and his words are prophetic. 
पता है उन्होंने क्या कहा था उन्होंने कहा उन्होंने कहा कि अगर सारे अरब्स भी रिकॉग्नाइज कर ले इसराइल को तब भी पाकिस्तान नहीं करेगा सो दीज आर प्रॉफिटिक वर्ड इतने अरब कंट्रीज ने कर लिया है पाकिस्तान पे पहले अमेरिका ने प्रेशर डाला लियात अली खान जब प्राइम मिनिस्टर थे अमेरिकन ने एक डेलीगेशन भेजा इट वॉज यू नो वी वर अ वेरी न्यूली इंडिपेंडेंट कंट्री फेसिंग प्रॉब्लम एंड दी अमेरिकन एंड दी अमेरिकन स्टेट जो डेलीगेशन आया उन्होंने कहा वील गिव यू एड वील गिव यू सपोर्ट प्लीज रिकोगनाइज इसराइल तो लियात अली खान का जवाब था कि जेंटलमैन पाकिस्तान इज नॉट फॉर सेल तो कायद आजम मोहम्मद अली जिना लियात अली खान और पाकिस्तानी लीडर्स फाउंडर्स जो थे फाउंडिंग फादर्स वो नहीं चाहते थे इसराइल को रिकोगनाइज करना क्योंकि इसराइल एक बिल्कुल ही यानी इंटरनेशनल लॉ को फ्लाउट करते हुए सब कुछ फ्लाउट करते हुए अमेरिकन इंटरेस्ट को प्रोटेक्ट करने के लिए एक अरेंजमेंट कर दिया गया तो अमेरिका शुरू से डे वन से अमेरिका वॉज द फर्स्ट कंट्री टू रिकोगनाइज इसराइल तो मैं समझती हूँ कि हमारी जो पॉलिसी रही है कंसिस्टेंटली वो सही है Thank you so much, madam, for all your time, and uh, it was a memorable session for me and for my students. And I am getting their messages that you have done a very good job in this session. And especially, your um, opinions have been very helpful. The all the misperceptions or misinformation regarding the entire issue it has cleared now, and uh, I believe that uh, we are going to uh, learn. how to use the historical references references uh, while uh, understanding and analyzing some uh, historical problem so bahut hi ek uh, acha session tha aapki taraf se aur mere paas uh, students ki taraf se bhi aapke liye bahut uh, regards hain thanks hain and compliments hain madam uh, usama khan says thank you everyone for all your valuable insight especially um, ms wizarat um, और बाकी सारों का भी आई वुड लाइक टू पे माई थैंक्स फॉर स्टेइंग फॉर टू आवर्स और लग जी रहा कि हमने दो घंटे इसमें इन डिस्कशन में गुजारे हैं वी आर स्टिल सो मच लेफ्ट टू डिस्कस एंड टू अंडरस्टैंड इनशाला विल आस्क मैडम विजारा टू कम समाइम टू डी एच एस सुफा यूनिवर्सिटी और मैडम आप जरूर आइएगा हमारे स्टूडेंट्स को जब इनशाला विल बी हैविंग अ रेगुलर ऑन कैंपस लाइफ बैक तो आप जरूर आइएगा और हमारे स्टूडेंट्स के साथ एक अच्छा सा सेशन दोबारा से जरूर कंडक्ट कीजिए इंशाल्लाह इंशाल्लाह ओके थैंक यू और सिद्रा आई मस्ट से आपने बहुत टाइमली स्टेप लिया बहुत आला क्वालिटी का आपके और स्पीकर्स जो थे वो भी और आपके स्टूडेंट्स जो हैं उनके बारे में तो आई एम श्योर दैट दे आर एक्सट्रीमली ब्राइट it's so good to see that people young people of your nation are so bright so do tell them that this is my opinion about them thank you very much allah hafiz good night and chand mubarak okay ma'am take care and aapko bhi chand mubarak i'm not prepared for it yeah. but anyway mai samajh rahi thi parson hogi अल्लाह खुदा हाफिज